Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, most compassionate, ever merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and may I greet you with the Islamic greeting of peace. If you know the reply, please do not hesitate to reply. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you all. Thank you for the honor of inviting me to contribute to the Limerick Civic Trust 2017 Autumn Lecture Series and to speak on immigration and integration. In the first part of my talk, I'm going to talk and discuss the phenomenon of immigration. And during this, I will be presenting you with some data, because without data, you're just another person with an opinion. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to discuss integration the various different challenges that we are facing currently in Ireland in terms of integration of all immigrants, but particularly the Muslim community, and what the solutions and recommendations are in my opinion. The Irish nation is not unfamiliar with the concept of immigration and emigration. The phenomenon of emigration from Ireland is recorded since early medieval times, but only became prevalent around 1700. Since then, between 9 and 10 people born in Ireland have emigrated. This is more than the population of Ireland as it, at its historical peak in the 1840s of 8.5 million. By the 21st century, an estimated 80 million people worldwide claim some Irish descent, which includes more than 36 million Americans who claim Irish as their primary ethnicity. For a country where emigration was so significant, the idea of immigration was quite alien until the 1950s. Mass immigration into Ireland is a relatively new phenomenon. The first notable immigrants to Ireland in the previous century were two groups, medical students from South Africa, from the Middle East, that traveled to Ireland to study medical science, and some of them they settled here and made Ireland their home. And secondly, the workers in the meat factories in Ireland, particularly a town that is important to, be mentioned, important to mention here is Ballyhonas in County Mayo. Most of these immigrants were also from South Africa and Asia, Pakistan to be specific. The Muslim immigration at the end of the 1990s was caused by the Irish economic boom and asylum seekers from diverse Muslim communities, countries. And in the 20 year period between 1991 and 2011, the Muslim population has increased 1000% from 0.1% to 1.1% of the population of Ireland. Just to give you an idea, according to the census of 1991, there were 3,873 Muslims living in Ireland. According to the census of 2006, there were 33,000 Muslims living in Ireland. The census 2011 concluded that there were 49,205 Muslims living in Ireland. And the census last year concludes that there are more than 63,000 Muslims living in Ireland. And I must mention here, ladies and gentlemen, that there was a notable figure, important figure, that was one of the earliest Muslim immigrants in this country. Immigrant by definition as someone who uh, comes to Ireland with the intention to settle down here, not with the intention to spend some time and go back. And that particular individual was a professor of Arabic, professor of Hindustani and professor of Persian in Trinity College, Dublin, with the name Mir Aulad Ali. Mir Aulad Ali spent 40 years of his life to lecture in Trinity College Dublin, and he was a Muslim scholar. In fact, the dress he used to wear was the dress, the traditional attire and dress that, that scholars would wear in the subcontinent. And it was very uh, significant that this person was so well integrated that he would be at all the important parties. In fact, when, the, uh, when, when certain representatives of the uh, government of Ro Romania came to Ireland, he was chosen to be the one that would, uh, that would uh, bring them to all the various different important sites in, in Dublin. But that was um, the last, uh, the century before the last century, 18, 1800s. Um, 
And then he passed away here. He made Ireland his home. He married, uh, and unfortunately, there was no children. Um, Muslims, I must say, ladies and gentlemen, do not represent the largest immigrant group, group in Ireland. We must not forget that Muslims are a smaller group when compared with other immigrants in Ireland. According to the 2016 census, there are 11.6 non-Irish immigrants living in Ireland. 7.6% of these immigrants are from Poland, UK, Lithuania, Romania, Latvia, and Brazil. And the remaining 4.6% are from other countries. The Muslim community in Ireland is diverse and growing rapidly. And its numbers are not determined by the country's history to the same extent as the UK and France, where the majority of the Muslims are immigrants or descendants of immigrants from former colonies, or Germany and Austria, where the majority of Muslims are Turkish migrant workers and their descendants. Generally, the Irish are known for Cade Mila Folcha, for the hundred thousands of welcomes. However, over the past decade or so, since Ireland has been transformed from a place where immigrants were few to a place where one resident out of six is born outside the country, the impact of this change on public opinion is of considerable. While before the Celtic Tiger, attitudes were very positive, the economic downturn after 2007 had a negative impact on attitudes to immigration. At the same time, there is evidence in the European Social Survey data that the Irish have become more accepting of people from various different backgrounds. How the trends in Irish opinion have diverged from those other in other European countries is an interesting question, which I am sure could be answered uh, with relating to the Irish experience of emigration. The findings concluded, for example, 81% of Irish people have a positive view of immigration from within the EU. 20 points above the EU average. Meanwhile, 57% of Irish people have a positive view of immigration from outside the EU, also 20 points above the EU average. Some 77% of Irish people agree with the proposition that immigrants contribute a lot to Ireland, substantially above the EU average of 44%. Irish attitudes have become more and more positive as the economy is improving. According to the survey, the public believes immigrants from the United Kingdom and are the best integrated, followed by those from the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Western Europe. At the opposite end of the scale, roughly 40% believe Muslims have a low level of integration, within the society, followed by travelers and those from Nigeria, South Africa, and other Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the landscape of Ireland has changed. It has become a diverse society due to immigration. The diversity contributes in many ways positively to the Irish society. It has fueled economy in Ireland as migrants are vital to Irish economy. The new Irish are playing an increasingly important role in many walks of life not least in sport, and have greatly enhanced the social, cultural, and economic fabric of our society. From the doctors and nursing staff in the hospitals of Ireland to the IT professionals in the various multinationals based in Ireland, from the chefs in the ethnic restaurants to the athletes in sports. And may I mention here, for example, an example of uh, Sheroz Akram, who was born in Pakistan, who is an emerging uh, athlete and who won last year uh, the All-Ireland Under-21. I may also mention Wexford Hurling, Lee Chen, the son of a Malaysian mother and an Irish father, who, is, uh, uh, who, who also is someone who comes from an immigrant background. And of course, we all know our own very own Tishok, Leho Farhatkar, who happens to be the son of an Indian uh, immigrant. When a community or immigrants migrate to another country, there are three models that they can adopt. They can adopt the model of isolation, they can adopt the model of assimilation, or they can adopt the model of integration. When we look at the Muslim community, Muslims are inspired by their uh, religious doctrine and by their prophet, the prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because 
Muslims adore him and, and very much try to follow his footsteps, I think it is important to quote what the prophetic traditions say about integration, assimilation, and isolation. The Prophet Muhammad himself was a refugee. He himself was an asylum seeker. He migrated. He fleed, in fact, because of the religious persecution, his homeland, Mecca, to another city, another region, Medina. When he came in Medina, he was welcomed, he was embraced, and he was able to practice his religion freely, and so were his other followers. The Prophet Muhammad, at the time of his migration, followed and adopted the method of integration. He rejected isolation and he rejected assimilation. And we can derive this from a, an authentic narration in Bukhari, one of the books the, with, the authentic, with the most authentic um, narrations uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And this is that when he arrived in Medina, Medina consisted mostly of Jew, Jews. And the Prophet Muhammad, within days after his arrival, realized that on the tent of Ashur, which is Yom Kippur, the Jews were all fasting. The Prophet Muhammad in, engaged and interacted with the larger community, the Jews, and he asked them why were they fasting on that day? What was the significance of fasting on that day? This itself, ladies and gentlemen, tells us that he did not choose the method of isolation. He did not choose to concern himself just with his own life and not engage with the larger society. He questioned and he interacted with them and he engaged with them. After having been told that the reason why the Jews are fasting on this day is because many thousand years ago, Moses, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he, was, he and his nation were given independence from the Egyptian Pharaoh. And this was one way to thank God by fasting. The Prophet Muhammad did not reject and refuse their tradition. In fact, he said that we also have something in common with you. We believe in Moses as you do. We consider him also to be a great man. So we will adopt the same practice as yours. We will also fast on this day. But he said, but in order to keep our own identity and in order not to assimilate, we will add one day to the fasting. So we will fast two days instead of just one. So the Prophet Muhammad didn't choose assimilation, neither did he choose um, isolation. He chose, he chose integration. And what integration also is, we can derive from another incident of the time of the Prophet Muhammad, that the Prophet Muhammad additionally made an important supplication. And the supplication is recorded in Bukhari, that he said, O oh God, bless the city of Medina twice as much as you have blessed Mecca. Mecca is the home country, the homeland of the Prophet. And he's asking God to bless Medina twice as much as Mecca. And Mecca is the city in which all Muslims, when they pray, they face towards that city because Kaaba, the house of God, is located in it. And yet he's asking God to bless Mecca, Medina twice as much as Mecca. Why is that? It is to give a message to all his followers that my religion teaches when you are embraced and accepted by the largest society, you give back to that society. You pray for it, you become genuinely loyal to it, and you always remember, you always want the good for that society. And this is why he prayed like that. Ladies and gentlemen, integration is a two way process. The host community and the migrant community need both to integrate. Governments need to ensure policies that are in place that will encourage the two ways a process of integration. Unfortunately, Ireland's response to migrants has mostly been of neglect. Very little thought has been practically given to integration by the governments. I believe firstly, that we do not need to reinvent the wheel. Immigrants have been coming from the Muslim background and other backgrounds to Europe for the past many, many decades. And we can learn from their experiences, whether they are negative or whether they are positive. Of course, there are challenges, but also there are, of course, successful stories. And we need to learn from those experiences. Muslim communities throughout Europe are facing two major challenges. And I can see, as someone who has lived here since 2004, I can see similar trends, similar patterns trending here to some extent. 
The two challenges Muslims are faced with, Muslim communities are faced with, is radicalization, extremism, and anti-Muslim sentiments and Islamophobia. Some members of the Muslim youth that are born and bred in Europe were radicalized and joined Daesh. The question is, what made these teenagers that were born and bred in the West develop this hatred and rejection of the same society they were living in? And why did they see the whole society as their enemy? In my opinion, there are two main factors that have contributed to this. The lack of inclusion and ideological radicalization through perversion of Islam. The lack of inclusion. These youngsters all fell in the trap of radicalization. And what is common among them is they were pushed into it. Their experiences of discrimination, racism, and lack of inclusion, I believe, led to their radicalization. The European Fundamental Rights Agency, based in Vienna, has launched today, the same day that I'm talking on immigration integration of Muslims in Ireland, it has launched today their second European Union Minorities and Discrimination Survey, Muslims Selected Findings. The survey captures the experience of Muslim immigrants and their EU-born children. The survey concludes that out of 10,500 Muslim, Muslims interviewed in 10 EU countries, 76% Muslims feel strongly attached to the countries they are living in. The vast majority of Muslims in the EU have a high sense of trust in democratic institutions despite experiencing widespread discrimination and harassment. 31% of those seeking work, for example, have been discriminated against over the last five years. 42% have been stopped by police in the last year because of their ethnic and religious background. The survey makes a mockery of the claim that Muslims aren't integrated in the society. On the contrary, Trust in democratic institutions is seen higher than much of the general population. However, every incident of discrimination and hate crime hampers their inclusion and reduces their chances of finding employment. This is very worrying, as it risks alienating individuals and their communities with potentially perilous consequences, and radicalization is, of course, one of them. What are the solutions? Successful integration through inclusion is the, is the solution. It minimizes isolation. Isolation and ghettoization leads to fear and misunderstandings. Fear and misunderstandings lead to hate, and hate leads to radicalization and extremism. And I can see slowly patterns of isolations and ghettoizations emerging within the Muslim community, but also within the Irish community in terms of anti-Muslim sentiments, in terms of Islamophobia, in terms of their, uh, their attitude towards Muslims. There are many examples how this isolation has led to the radicalization within Europe among Muslims born and bred in Europe. Successful integration is when everyone has a sense of community cohesion, irrespective of their diverse background. Appreciating the diversity is a two-step process. In the first step, you acknowledge the commonalities we share, we all share. For example, that we share the same residency, we share the same country, we share the same society, we all have families, and that we want to bring bread on table for our children. We, are very, we often have the same challenges in terms of housing, employment, access to education, etc., and also wanting to have a healthier lifestyle. In the second step, we should learn about each other's differences. What makes others different? What do others believe in? What faith do they have? Or no faith? What lifestyle do they have? How can we develop, despite these differences, a plural society where there is religious freedom and a society that is free from racism, free from xenophobia, free from discrimination, anti-Semitism, anti and anti-Muslim hatred, and a society free from hatred for the LGBT or the travelers. I think education is the answer. Learning about each other should start from a very young age. I think that it should start from the primary school. Our schools should celebrate the diversity. A few years ago, 
I was approached by a priest to sign a letter to condemn that in a particular school, the pupils, the students in the school had celebrated an LGBT week. All students had to write a project on LGBT challenges. A member of the LGBT came into school and talked to the students. And the priest was extremely angry and wanted me, as a Muslim scholar, also to sign this letter. And I instead, I suggested that we should suggest to the school, as they have organized an LGBT week, they should also hold a Muslim week. They should also have a Christian week. They should also have an atheist week. They should also have a traveler's week. Because I believe that our children, the, the school's intention was to promote tolerance, acceptance and understanding. And I think that we need to develop that about all communities, about the Christians, the faithful, but also about the Muslims, about the Jews, about travelers, about all various different communities. So schools must also encourage, I believe, visits to places of worship, different places of worship. Such visits will enrich young children of the diversity of our society and also give a sense of belonging to those whose place of worship is visited by fellow students. Speaking of literacy, it is important to stress that it is never too late for those who aren't in school anymore. Training of diversity, multiculturalism, human rights and pluralism should be given also to public officials, service providers, religious leaders, community leaders, parents, etc. The state should fund projects which produce cooperation between different communities. I believe such initiatives will immensely contribute to a peaceful society and prevent the spread of hate and racism and extremism. Number three, implementation of hate crime legislation. The Immigrant Council of Ireland published last year a report entitled Islamophobia in Dublin, Experiences and How to Respond, written by Dr. James Carr of the Department of Sociology in the University of Limerick, who happens to be among the audience today. The report concludes that anti-Muslim racism and discrimination is a reality in Ireland also. Ireland is not immune to this kind of racism and discrimination, although relatively it is much less compared to other EU countries because of the experience of the Irish, I suppose, that were living in the UK and many years ago were all tarred with the same brush. But despite that, we see a rise of anti-Muslim sentiments, racism, attacks, physical assaults. So, so it proposed, the Irish uh, Immigrant Council of Ireland proposed implementation of hate crime legislation to minimize alienation of Muslims. And I would say, as a Muslim scholar, I would, ex I would, I would add to that uh, also hate crime legislation against anyone, against the, the Jews, against the, the faithful, against the Christians, against anyone, again, against the other. I would include the other, all of those that come under that. Number four, encourage integration through participation in media and politics. The state must encourage inter in integration through participation in media and politics. Despite that the immigrants count 11.6% of the total population of Ireland, yet they are not represented in the media and neither in the politics, proportionately. We need to share the success stories of integration. Campaigns that will create awareness of how Muslims and other immigrants are very well integrated in Ireland. How when you visit a hospital, you may have been treated by a Muslim and who does not in your face tell that he is a Muslim, but he's there as an Irish person, as a human to serve you. You must encourage the participation of immigrants, particularly Muslims, in media and politics. Political parties should allocate a minimum percentage of their seats to immigrants. The Senate, for example, must have some seats allocated for the immigrants or the new Irish. Number five, St. Patrick's Day celebrations to include diversity. St. Patrick was an immigrant and is celebrated by all the Irish. I would like to see that St. Patrick's Day celebrations include the new Irish. 
encouraged their participations in the celebrations and parades. Myself and my family all wear the colors green and orange and celebrate St. Patrick's Day by joining the parade in Blanchettstown. This year, I dedicated my whole Friday sermon to why as Muslims we, we can and we should celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Number six, representation and reporting of Muslims in the media. I think that the representation and reporting of Muslims or anything that is related to Muslims should be, should be very responsible. Unfortunately, the media, as we all know, likes to sens sensationalize because that is what sells. But at what cost? At the cost of alienating a whole community? Although in Ireland we do not have that problem as in the UK, in France or the Netherlands, yet we do find certain media outlets, when they talk about Muslims. It is always in the context of extremism, always in the context of radicalization. Myself, who has been asked to speak and has spoken on many, many platforms in the media, whenever I'm on television, I'm speaking on radicalization, on extremism. And there is so much more to this community. We are like any other community. We have celebrations, we have families, we have challenges that you and us all together are, are facing. Why is it that whenever the name Muslims comes in the media, it has to always come into to association of extremism and radicalization. Although it is important that the incidents perpetrated by terrorists in the name of Islam must be reported. But at the same time, it must, be, it, it, it must not be just these incidents. That's very important also to remember. Um, the second challenge we Muslims are facing, ladies and gentlemen, is ideological radicalization through perversion of Islam. Radicalization in the EU through mosques and Islamic centers funded by Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries. Radicalization either happens online or through someone face to face, either outside the mosque, sometimes in the mosque, or in the Islamic center. But what is really interesting is all those that perpetrated attacks and that adhere to the perpetrated attacks uh, in Europe, they all have one thing in common. They all visited um, mosques or Islamic centers that were funded by Saudi Arabia. Like the Irish that migrated to the US, Muslims also established places of worship mosques and Islamic centers. And these Islamic centers and mosques are not just places of worship, they are community centers. The first thing any immigrant community does when it comes together is to find, uh, is to establish a community center. And for the Muslims, irrespective of their language, irrespective of the nationality, whether they come from the, from, from the Arab countries, the African countries, or Asian countries, or East Europe, they all want to have that community center. And often it is a mosque or it is the Islamic center. Because, because of the lack of resources and funding in the West, and these immigrants mostly are not only feeding themselves and trying to to, to, get, to have financial stability, they also are looking after their family members back in the native countries. So for them, one of the challenges they are facing is the lack of resources to establish that community center, that mosque and Islamic center that they really need. And the lack of resources and funding in the West gives an opportunity to some in the Middle East to fund mosques and Islamic centers in the West. Often such funding comes with consequences, heavy consequences, for the whole society. A particular understanding of Islam, known as Wahhabism, is propagated through these centers. We must be aware of the dangers of this ideology, this perversion of Islam. All militant groups, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, Daesh, ISIS, all have one thing in common, all adhere to the same Wahhabi ideology. To give you an idea about this ideology, what people that, 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 that believe or that visit these mosques, what kind of Islam are they really getting? They are not getting the traditional Islam. 
They were not taught about mainstream Islam. They are taught about an Islam that is the Wahhabi brand of Islam. An Islam that promotes an us and them narrative. An Islam that prohibits genuine friendly relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. It promotes that democracy is evil and that we must bring back the caliphate. It strongly discourages pluralism and religious freedom. It considers interfaith activities like wishing someone a, a happy Christmas or Merry Christmas as haram, as prohibited. It encourages women to cover their face, wear the niqab, which is not a religious obligation at all. It teaches that apostates must be killed. I recently read in the media about a mosque being established in my own area, Blanchardstown. I didn't hear about the plan to extend that mosque through sources within the Muslim community. And I can tell you my sources within the Muslim community are very, very strong. But whoever is behind that project are so secretive about it. And why aren't they? Why shouldn't they? Because they know that if I had known before, I would have raised the alarm. Through the media, I have found out that they are openly suggesting that they are going to gain funding from Saudi Arabia, from Pakistan, and from Leicester. And in Leicester, the Muslim community that they are trying to get funding from, you just need to Google and do your research or visit Leicester and see the Muslims there and compare them to the Muslims in other parts. And I'm not saying every Muslim in Leicester, but mostly. They all will follow this particular doctrine. They'll be living in Britain, but they will wear dress that isn't associated with Islam, is associated with a particular region in the world, in the Arab world. And they will often, uh, they will often present themselves as uh, that they, they're not integrating, they're not interested in integration. So to have those people invest in a mosque in Ireland, to have Saudi Arabia invest in a mosque in Ireland, and the Middle East countries is something that I find highly problematic because I can see the effects, the devastating effects it will have for my community, but also for the larger community. So what are the solutions in my view? Immediately ban funding from abroad, especially Saudi Arabia, to Islamic organizations in Ireland. The state should look after the community needs. Although the state has always adopted the approach of the separation of the church and, and, and state, I think it is important that the state reviews its position because this position may actually do much more harm to the society than any benefit. The state should look after the community needs and requirements of their citizens. By funding Islamic centers, community centers, it eliminates foreign influence and also can set certain standards of integration before, granting, before grants or funding is approved for an Islamic community center. For example, anyone that wishes to have an Islamic community center and wishes to have that funding um, needs to ensure women must be part of the management. They must include activities that promote cooperation with other communities. They must have interfaith activities. They must have English language classes, for example, to promote integration. And they must also encourage visits to the mosque, open days, etc. So that's the first thing. Immediately ban the funding from abroad for Islamic organizations in Ireland. And secondly, because there is a gap, and to fill that gap, to, to identify within the Muslim community partners whom they can fund and who, who, whom they can support in terms of establishing Islamic centers that promote the message of peace, tolerance, acceptance, and pluralism. Number two, state to facilitate a regulatory body for Muslim affairs in Ireland. I believe that the state should facilitate a body that will look after all the affairs of Muslims in Ireland, a regulatory body. A body that consists of Muslims of various different backgrounds, Sunni, Shia, Diobandi, etc. And of leaders from all these different denominations that come all around the table and that should be tasked 
to regulate all the curriculum taught in the mosques, in the madrasas where children go for the religious education. It must also ensure that Friday sermons in mosques are not inspiring young teenagers to travel abroad and participate in conflicts abroad, instead to promote participation in public life here. The case of Ibrahim Halawa is a very interesting case. The case of Ibrahim Halawa is a case where a young Irish and Egyptian teenager travels to Egypt with the intention to participate in politics there, to protest there. Now there is of course one way of looking at this, which is, it is his right as an Egyptian citizen to, pro, pro, to protest democratically. But there is also another way of looking at things, which I think is another extreme end, that, well, he's not Irish at all, he is not our problem, why are we wasting our resources, why are we giving media attention to his case, let him rot in the jails of Cairo, God forbid. That's another extreme end. We should be people that follow the balanced and moderate way. Yes, he is Irish, he's Egyptian. He has the right to participate in politics in Ireland as well as in Egypt. You can't take the love of his home country out of his heart. But at the same time, as a Muslim scholar, and the son of a Muslim scholar, he's a son of a Muslim imam, I believe that the Muslim imam is supposed to be teaching children growing up in Ireland that they should participate in the society. They should participate in public life here. They should contribute in this society. And they should not be brainwashed to go and participate in conflicts abroad. Conflicts abroad, particularly in the Middle East, in Pakistan, in subcontinent, are, are areas where there is no democracy, no justice, no rule of law. Why would you want to send your children there? While in this country, in this part of the world where we are living, we have pluralism, we have religious freedom, we have democracy. And anybody can become the Taoiseach if he has the talents. If, 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 you know, anybody that participates in public life, there is really no limitations. So I would say, and I strongly, strongly, strongly discourage Muslims in Ireland, Muslim teenagers, Muslims born and bred in this country, to go back to their fatherland or the homeland to participate in conflicts there. You are living in this country, you are living, getting your education here. And as the Prophet himself, he never traveled back to Mecca to participate in politics there. He actually went back when Mecca was conquered and everyone was forgiven, but he never chose to stay there. He actually came back to Medina and he, he died in Medina with the people of Medina because Medina for him was more important than Mecca. And I think that is the message that I would give to my followers and, and people that come to my mosque, that following the tradition of the Prophet, it is natural to have love for your homeland. It is natural to have that passion. But at the same time, when you are embraced in a society uh, where the society gives you opportunities that you do not have in your homeland, you must give back to that country. And that is by participating in that society, in public life. Also, we saw a lot of negative comments um, of, of, of racism, discrimination, xenophobia regarding this case. But I think that anyone, irrespective of, her, of, his, of his ideology, irrespective of his, his way of looking at things, I think everybody deserves a fair and free, a fair ruling and, and, and justice. And that we should, we should, uh, we should uh, ask and we should demand that everybody gets that. So hopefully, he will be back soon with his family, and I would love his father to actually admit that it was wrong for his son to go there, because he hasn't admitted that. I would love his father to say that, in the, through the congregation, that I made a mistake, and we should all learn from this mistake, and I ask nobody to send the children abroad to participate in conflicts abroad. Because this is not about Islam versus, you know, kufr, or things like that. Thirdly, Muslim leadership must reach out. There is a responsibility on the shoulders of Irish Muslims. You know, whether we like it or not, every Muslim has a responsibility. We're all ambassadors of our religion, particularly in, in this day and age where um, people think all Muslims are extremists and terrorists. And people are, in the name of our religion, killing innocent people. What should we do? I think uh, Muslims must reach out more. 
It is important to speak out for Muslims against perversion of their faith. I have been doing this since 2005. I have been doing it since I came in Ireland and after 9-11, 2005. And from that time until today, I've been consistent in that. And I've seen Muslim leaders in this country being silent, a long silence. In fact, denial sometimes that, there, that people are killing in the name of Islam. Um, and thank God that there is a change there. Because this Imam, for example, uh, he did not speak on, uh, he did not condemn, he did not speak or give any attention to, um, to these terrorist attacks. He remained, chose to remain silent. In fact, when I said two years ago, Muslims, and I, I established and launched a website, jihad.info, and then later on established the Irish Muslim Peace and Integration Council, I called the Muslims in Ireland that if they know of anyone that is radicalized, that has extreme views, hate narratives, they must inform the local religious leaders, the imams, and, and if they find that it is seriously, you know, it, it is something really worrying and some, that person may do something, he, they must report it to Gardi. When I said this, the same imams questioned my intentions. Um, I was called within my community by, not the majority, thank God, but by certain elements that did not agree with me uh, that this person is probably on the payroll of the government. The reality is that until today, I haven't received a single euro of funding from any uh, government, any state, any body. And I've traveled to Brussels, I've traveled to Vienna, I've traveled to European Commission, all to give this message out and not for any funding. Uh, just to ensure that the religion that I follow, that religion cannot be hijacked. Nobody in the name of this religion should be, re should be radicalized. Our communities must be immune to radicalization. And it's the duty of the religious leaders to ensure that. So I think it is important to speak out for Muslim leaders against perversion of the faith. So when I did so, these Imams questioned my intentions, but I'm glad to see a change in their attitude. Because this year, in the beginning of this year, the same Imam actually said the same thing that I said two years ago. He said, if any Muslim knows of anyone that is extreme radical, he must report it to the Gardi. That's exactly what I said two years ago. So it is great to see that change. During the attack in London, not the one of last week, the previous attack. Um, we, Muslim leaders from Europe, I can say, the, the trend was, it was a change within the, within the leadership. Previously, leadership would often say, we don't need to condemn because we, ha we haven't done it. You know, it's done in our name, but we don't need to condemn every single act because do Christians, for example, uh, condemn atrocities if they, are hap if, if they are done by the KKK, for example, or by others? Or do, do we have that similar trend where, when people also in the name of their religion or in the name of their community need to come out and defend themselves? So that was the question put forward by many of the Muslim leaders. But again, now, because this extremism, radicalization, has immensely increased Islamophobia, immensely increased anti-Muslim sentiments, now it makes sense to them. Now they understand the importance of speaking out. So what happened is, after the London attack, more than 120 Muslim scholars from the UK, and myself included, we gave a statement, and that statement was, and this did not happen before in history, and we said, Anyone that, is, that is, uh, has committed atrocities like these, where he has killed innocent people or she has killed innocent people, when that person dies, we as Muslim scholars will not be part of the funeral of that person. And the funeral is a very significant, important thing in, in, the, in our religion. And we will not participate in it at all. Which means that as community leaders, we, we will exclude you. We will, we will, we, yes, you are a Muslim, okay, but what you did is so appalling that we as leaders, community leaders, we don't want to be part of any of it. And that is a strong message for any potential terrorist that one of the consequences of your um, you know, attack, of your, of your atrocity, is not that you, I mean, the leaders are saying we will not be part of asking God for forgiveness for you, we will not pray for you, we will not participate in the funeral for you, which ultimately tells them that it is rejected by the community leaders. So I have to review what I think I'm doing you know, in, in the name of religion, if it's right or not. Um, also, um, I think um, that speaking out against provision of faith, uh, we need more counter-narratives. 
There are hate narratives, but we must have counter narratives to that hate narratives. People that believe democracy is evil. From the pulpit of the mosque and Islamic centers, imams and shiuchs must say, why is democracy not evil? Why is it perfectly compatible with Islam? Those that believe as, Muslim, with, as Muslims you cannot have genuine friendly relations with non-Muslims must be told from the pulpit of the mosque that what Islam says about uh, having not Muslim, non-Muslim relations, friendly relations, how it encourages it, how it inspires us, for example, to have so. My role as a Muslim leader is to, to, to not only say that we need to do that, but also uh, not only to talk, but walk the talk. So I, for example, two years ago invited in our mosque um, a Holocaust survivor, Jewish Holocaust survivor, Tomi Reichenthal. And Tomi Reichenthal came to the mosque and not only did we invite him to participate in the meal in Ramadan, we actually celebrated his 80th birthday in the mosque. And, and the whole idea behind it was not only to send out a message to the larger community that, you know, we as Muslims, we are very open-minded, you know, there's nothing like all Muslims are anti-Semitists and, you know, are against Jews, no. And all Muslims deny Holocaust, there is nothing like that. Uh, the majority of Muslims, when they hear about the Holocaust, are, are appalled and are, are extremely, you know, emotional. And you see tears from their eyes because, you know, it's so inhumane what happened. Um, and I, I invited Somi to share his story from the pulpit of the mosque. And people that attended, among them, there were people that were actually had, had denied the Holocaust. There were people that wouldn't believe in it. There were t people that had anti-Semitic feelings. Um, and, and what happened is by listening to him, just 20 minutes, listening to him and by their sheikh, their own Muslim leader, to speak about it and wh how important it is to uh, engage and why we must all be against this. It changed the mindset of those people. I mean, one of them was a businessman from Belfast who's been living there for uh, 45 years. A person of that age, even that interaction of a half an hour, an hour, changed his perception about uh, about so it's an education process of education also for the Muslim community itself. Uh, the next year we extended our invitation to the in, to the LGBT community, which was quite historic also. Um, and and the whole idea was not that we agree as Muslims, uh, you know, with 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 the act of uh, no we don't. But at the same time, despite our disagreement, we agree on common humanity. We agree that we are all human beings. We agree that we have to live and share this space, this world, this, this country, all together. And these things, um, you know, I mean, why should these things be an obstacle to having good relations? They shouldn't be. And if anybody makes them obstacles, they aren't really following the tradition of faith. Uh, and this is what I strongly believe in, and that inspires me. And this is why I invited the members of the LGBT community also. I think, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to conclude now that the Irish people are, of course, very welcoming. However, things are changing. We are seeing patterns, as I said, that are changing. And I think it is quite worrying. I think that if we do not have these, if we do not act upon the solutions that I have mentioned, we would actually be similar to the Netherlands or, or um, you know, the UK in 20 or 30 years. And I would, I think that is going to be really a big, big, you know, shame for us to be in that position. While we can learn from the lessons from our neighbors, um, the Dutch people, I myself was grown up in the Netherlands, I speak Dutch fluently. Um, the Dutch people, if you look at their attitude towards Muslims, towards immigrants, towards the Turkish immigrants, many of them were from Turkey and from Morocco, Moroccans, was extremely positive. In fact, many members um, have told me from the Muslim community from Turkish origin in the Netherlands that, for example, when they arrived in the 60s and the 70s, many Dutch people wouldn't actually uh, take rent from them when they lived and shared, uh, shared uh, you know, a room in their house. They would actually be so happy to, to accept the stranger in the house. They were so happy and so thankful that in, they in fact would look after them as, you know, as guests. But unfortunately, the same Dutch people, you know, within a generation, things change to that extent that now populism is on the rise. You have people like Geert Wilders, 
being so successful. And the Netherlands has scored in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the study, in the report that is published today, launched today by the European Fundamental Rights Agency as one of the lowest in terms of um, integration of Muslims in, Ireland, in, in, in the Netherlands. To look at that, and very, very, you know, shocking. And this, these Dutch Muslims, they have been there for three generations. Many of them are born, this is their generation, and they speak the language. I mean, myself, for example, when I speak with my brothers that live in the Netherlands, we never speak any other language than Dutch. That's just, no, we don't consider ourselves really Pakistani when we are in the Netherlands. We just, we're Dutch. That's what it is. And okay, I've got the best of both worlds. I'm Irish as well now. So I'm Irish and I'm Dutch. Um, and of course, I have the Pakistani origin. And I think, you know, all these different identities that we have should not necessarily be an obstacle. And, and they, they, they bring all richness, they bring all, you know, great things on the table. And to see the Dutch people like that, I wondered what made them change. And I thought about it quite a lot. And I came to the conclusion that it was the failure of the governments to engage, to, to engage in integration and to promote integration and the failure of the governments to um, engage with the Muslims in terms of regulatory bodies. Anybody can establish a mosque, even in Ireland now. Anyone can hire a, ho can hire a house. It is not like the church, the Catholic church where there is a you know, hierarchical system. And many, many people I've met, they, Catholics, they don't like it. But I will tell you, I, you know, when I look at it, I find so, so many advantages of it. Because when I compare it with my community, where there is no hierarchical system for the past two centuries in, in Sunni Islam, um, I find that you know, anybody can establish a mosque in Ireland or in Europe, anywhere. You don't need any permission. It's great religious freedom. But what about Who's going to be the imam? Who's going to be the religious leader? Many imams in Europe happen to be accidental imams. Happen to be accidental imams, which means that they, weren't, they aren't qualified. They didn't, never you know, had the training to be imams, to be in that position. In fact, the only thing they have is probably they speak Arabic. And if, if among Pakistanis, 100 Pakistanis, there is one Arab, they'll say, let's make him the imam. He speaks Arabic. And if there is someone who knows the Qur'an by heart, which many Muslims know, uh, hundreds and thousands of Muslims around the world know the whole Qur'an by heart, myself included. And anyone that knows the Qur'an by heart is a Hafiz. And when I was a Hafiz, I, I was 11 years old. I became a Hafiz at the age of 11. And when I became a Hafiz, I was very proud of it. My, my parents were very proud, of course, and there was a very big party where a lot of Muslim scholars and Muslims from Holland came to wish me and, and you know, pray for me and uh, congratulate me. But it was only after a few, uh, you know, years or two, a year or two after that, that when I was talking about this in front of a friend of mine whose father was a Hindu, and I mentioned proudly, I boasted, you know, I know the whole Quran by heart. He asked me, well, do you know what it means? And that was, you know, that, that was the revolution I just needed because I don't, like, what, what am I proud of? I don't know what it means. So that prompted me actually to study and, and to, to pursue my religious studies and to travel to Pakistan. But the reality is there are so many accidental imams out there. They're in the position of authority. They are on the pulpit teaching about religion without actually knowing religion at all. And many are teaching perversion of faith. And they are teaching that to Muslims, to teenagers, to children. I mean, I, I have heard uh, about uh, a particular, you know, place where the imam, who is not really an imam, is an accidental imam, who is teaching children, as Muslims, you must always hate the Jews. And I'm like, you know, I, I was so shocked and appalled at that. How could he say that? Has he not read the Quran? How the Quran praises the Jews, praises the Christians? Similarly, I've met, for example, someone who was taught uh, by someone, in, in, uh, by another teacher uh, in a madrasa that um, women should be at home and they, it's wrong for them to work. It's, not ha it's haram, it's forbidden for them to work. And I was like, that's not Islam, that's pure culture. But that person was teaching that to children. So we have accidental imams, we have teachers in madrasas. As Muslims, we want our children to know the Qur'an, how to read the Qur'an. So at the age of five, we send them to the mosques. 
We send them to the madrasas where they are taught how to read the Quran. And in these madrasas, there is absolutely no standard when it comes to, okay, there must, is there a standard curriculum being taught? No. We just want our children to know how to read the Quran. So anybody that volunteers can be the teacher as long as he knows how to read the Quran, which is absolutely irresponsible. Because in the country that we live in, if you want our children to go to junior infants or preschool, then in preschool there are even teachers that have to follow two years education, that have to go through some training before they can actually engage with children at that level. And when it comes to teaching religious education in madrasas um, that are not regulated, of course, in mosques, why, are, why is the state silent on that? It is a matter of religion, yes, but to be silent and to keep it, to keep it you know, this is the community, let them deal with it, that is going to actually create the problems that are created in the Netherlands and the UK. And that is the one thing, I think. And the second thing what changed is also the failure of the Muslims in those countries, immigrants uh, in the Netherlands, to engage and reach out. I think they didn't reach out a lot because many of them were like immigrants. They were just busy with trying to build up their life, trying to look after the families back home in the home countries and to, to have you know, a good life. And they weren't really thinking about how important it is for them to actually build relations, to engage in, uh, in, in politics, to participate in public life. They didn't think of those things. And yet until today, you have actually Muslims or you have immigrants, I would say, not just Muslims. And you have them among Polish also. You have them among Latvians also that actually live in Ireland or live in the Netherlands. And you go to their home, they don't watch RTE. They don't watch, you know, uh, TV3. They, they don't watch any of that. What do they watch? Well, they watch Al Jazeera. They watch, they watch uh, you know, they watch the stations from their own countries. And I think we need to encourage, and the state needs to encourage, but also the, gov the, the community itself needs to take responsibility. And the leaders of the community, the religious leaders particularly, because Muslims are, uh, are a very faithful, very religious community. They listen to the religious leaders, and the religious leaders must, um, must, uh, must promote this kind of you know, integration where there is more reaching out to the other uh, to ensure that there is less misunderstandings, less misconceptions. And that, I believe, will all lead to a plural society. I believe will lead to a very coexisting, uh, peaceful society that we really need in Ireland. And we have it so far, but we need to make sure and ensure that it remains like this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.